Hello, everyone. My name is Janet Forrest. I'm head of adult programs here at the Nantucket Athenaeum, along with my colleague Sammy Aguiar in the back. Welcome. I just wanted to ask you quickly to uh, silence any devices or phones that might think noise. And um, as we're a public library and we serve everyone in the community, we just ask that you keep your mask on uh, throughout the event. And I will pass it off to Yvonne Valencourt to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Um, thanks everyone for coming out tonight. Um, we're so excited to share uh, some of this with you too. Sorry, there we go. Thank you. Sorry, can you guys, could you hear that okay? Okay, thanks uh, again for coming out. My name is Yvonne Valencourt and I'm the director of the Nantucket Field Station and we're really excited to share all this data. Um, tonight, there'll be an overview. This is part one of a two day event. Tomorrow, if you'd like to learn more details or interact and talk to people directly about the different components of the work that Juanita and her lab um, has been doing, please join us at Center Street, 56 Center Street at the uh, Nantucket Music School and Community Center. Um, to, we'll be on the porch and in the garden and we'll have a poster session where you can speak with people individually. So it should be really interesting. Uh, but this evening, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Juanita Urban Rich and she runs a lab up in Boston at UMass Boston. And as I said, if you don't know me, I'm from the field station. I live here year round. Um, we're out at Pulpus Road if you haven't been there, but I know most of you have. And uh, we welcome the public. We uh, do sit on land that's owned by the Nantucket Conservation Foundation, and we're happy to often partner with them and a number of other institutions on the island and foundations. We also run university courses, and we support a lot of researchers across a wide range of different things that come out to use the station and to be on Nantucket. Um, so please come and visit us. And uh, without any further ado, I'd like to uh, invite Juanita to come up and speak to you about um, the last couple of years of microplastic work that's been done on Nantucket. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming, for hearing about this. <clears throat> um, I wanted to talk about as Yvonne said, the work that we've been doing since 2019 on looking at microplastics around Nantucket, go over with you some of the things we've learned, some of the things we still don't know. Um, spearheading this project with myself and Yvonne was also Graham Durovich from the <clears throat> Nantucket Department of Public Works and lots and lots of students and lots of volunteers. So I want to step back first before we get into everything at uh, Nantucket and do a bit of an intro. So what is plastic? You can see in this image that there's a lot of different shapes, colors to plastic, but what really is it? <clears throat> it is man-made for one thing. There's synthetic and um, semi-synthetic plastics. So if you're synthetic plastic, that means you're petroleum based. If you're semi-synthetic, that means you're cellulose based. And cellulose, as most of you probably know, comes from plant material. It is material um, polymers that can be shaped when they're so, uh, heated. They can be shaped and formed into bottles, bags, you name it, lots of different things. And then they harden it. Um, and we can use them. <clears throat> but all these different polymers, whether you're polypropylene, polyester, nylon, have other chemicals added to them. Some of them are dyes that color them. Some of them are various um, plasticizers or stabilizers that help to make plastic either more flexible or more rigid. Um, we also sometimes add chemicals like uh, flame retardants. 
um, to help keep people safe from when they're using them. Plastic is not inherently bad. Plastic pollution can be, <clears throat> but plastic itself is not. <clears throat> um, it was developed really in the 1800s. It really became um, part of our economy in the world after World War II. But plastic is used in the medical world um, to help keep things sterile. Um, it also is used a lot with food to help keep food fresh longer. Plastic is lighter than a lot of other products that can be used to build those same things like metal or wood. So therefore it costs less to ship it and transport it and we use less fuel. Um, Plastic is also strong. It's used in bike helmets. It's used in cars in a lot of ways that help protect us. It can be molded and shaped into a lot of different objects from this microphone to our cell phones, the computer, the water bottles. Um, it's also economical. The problem with plastic is how much plastic exists today. So plastic takes a long, long time to degrade. It's an organic carbon molecule. And like all organic things, it will eventually go back to being CO2. But for plastic, this usually takes hundreds of years. So the problem is just how much is around. And some of this is due to the single use of plastic. Those bags, bottles, take out containers that we use one time and then toss away. Human behavior that lit causes littering, the dropping of it, the ripping of your <clears throat> uh, food wrapper and you accidentally discard it or not accidentally. And then the mismanagement of waste. So with all of this, plastic production, as I said, really came into strong being after World War II. And we've had this exponential increase in plastic production. And since about 2000, here, more than 50% of the plastic has been produced. And it's expected that by about 2050, we'll, we'll have produced about 12 billion tons. Right now we're about 400 million tons. And this plastic life cycle, and here I'm talking more the synthetic plastics, um, starts with pumping the oil out of the ground, <clears throat> extracting it, sending it to the refineries where it's uh, um, <clears throat> refined and made into these plastic granules or little girdles. They then get shipped around to different uh, industries where it gets melted, formed, fabricated into the actual object that we want. Um, and then it is shipped out again to shops for us to buy it. And then we start to use it. Sometimes we repurpose it. Sometimes we recycle it. Um, and then it has its end of life. It gets thrown out, it gets sent to the landfill, it gets incinerated or it gets recycled. But of that 400 million that's been produced now, only about 12% of that has been incinerated, meaning burned back to CO2. 9% <clears throat> of it has been recycled. That means 79% of that 400 million is in landfills or in the environment somewhere. <clears throat> and throughout this whole stage of producing and getting the oil to making those plastic granules to the fabrication, there's leaks of this plastic into the environment. What happens to it? when it gets there in the environment. Sometimes we see it washed up on our beaches or along our roadways or in our fields. These big macro 
jugs, bottles, foam, ropes, nets, lots of different things get discarded. It doesn't stay there. A lot of these big objects, my phone, break down into what are known as microplastics. Microplastics are particles that are less than five millimeters down to one micron in size. So one water bottle, one object will produce thousands of microplastics. So how does this happen? There are a lot of different processes that make those microplastics. One of them is mechanical degradation. This is just the abrasion and really physical breaking of an object. It can happen by people ripping things. It can happen by an animal biting and tearing an object. It can happen by the um, object rolling in the waves across the sand tires across the roadways as we're driving. That friction produces microplastics. <clears throat> you also have chemical oxidation, the heating, the freezing that can change the makeup of the particle and cause it to break down and biodegrade. You also get photo degradation or UV sunlight coming and heating this object and usually it's making it more brittle, more likely to break up mechanically into these tiny little pieces. Um, I said you have biodegradation. Again, that could be animal action. It can be bacteria. You get biofilms forming on it that makes pits and cracks that weaken the object, making it more likely to break. So if we look at it, whether we start as a plastic bottle, a plastic bag, or we start as a microplastic. Over time, those particles get smaller and smaller. Whether you start from a macro object or a micro, you're breaking down into smaller and smaller pieces, even down into nanoplastics, which are smaller than one micron. The total number of particles is increasing, again, as you're breaking into smaller things. But the total mass, yes, it decreases a little bit, but not a lot, because very little of that plastic is actually being totally recycled, regenerated back to the CO2. So what does this mean? It means that plastic is everywhere. It is now part of all of those cycles in nature. It can be <clears throat> taken up into the atmosphere so that we have pools of plastic up in the air that can come down with rain or snow or just gravity. It can be trans. It be transported through our rivers, out to our oceans, out to a lake, to a pond. It can settle and get buried in the um, sediment of any of those aquatic bodies. It can be buried in the soil. <coughs> Once you're in the ocean, that's the primary reservoir for all of this plastic. So from the atmosphere, from rivers, from land, the majority of this plastic is eventually making it into the ocean. Some of it floats on the surface. It's less dense than seawater. Some types of plastic like your PVC is denser and it sinks down. As you get biofilms forming on it, it changes the density of even your light uh, plastics, your polypropylene. And so, you start to get it throughout the whole water column where it can interact with different biota. It can sink down. We found it at the very bottom of the ocean in the Marianas Trench. It's being found everywhere now. <coughs> and plastic, once it's produced, once it's used by people, doesn't stay where 
it gets used or where it gets thrown away, it can be transported. So as I mentioned, it can go through the river. Your larger plastic items, they tend to settle more quickly or get caught in the weeds and held in one area. Your smaller pieces, they float down that river. They get exported out to the ocean. As those big objects break, those little pieces come out. <clears throat> Microfibers, which come off a lot of our clothing, come off of ropes and things like that. It's estimated that there's an annual export to the Atlantic Ocean of almost two tons of microfibers in a year. It can also be transported, as I said, atmospherically. And this atmospheric cycle, this is something that we don't totally understand or, or know everything about yet. It's a newer area of the field. But you get emissions from the ocean. Plastic from, as the waves break, pop plastic up into the atmosphere and into the wind. It gets pulled up. It may stay within the marine system. It may go up, it may come back down and deposited there. It may get transported from the marine to the terrestrial, or it may get moved the other way from the terrestrial out to the marine system or aquatic system. And again, you have different ways of emission. And ultimately, as I said, it ends up in the ocean. And here, some of that plastic that's in the ocean gets washed up on beaches, gets buried in the sand. Depending upon the energetics of the waves and the type of environment, it may slowly deposit, just like certain areas, you get a lot of sediment building up. If you have a high energy beach, maybe that plastic gets actually injected or further down into the sediment or remixed back up and brought up into the water where it can be transported with the water further down. <clears throat> Some of that plastic starts to sink and you can get suggested, egested, moved around throughout that whole water column. <clears throat> So again, being transported physically, but also biologically. All of this means that at least in the ocean, microplastic distribution is not even. Ocean currents, the big ocean gyre systems move plastic around. There are certain places where plastic's produced and certain places where plastic is shipped to as waste. We're not always a fair world. We sometimes send our waste to other places to deal with, it. but that means they just end up getting more microplastics by them. <clears throat> These big systems end up retaining plastic. So I'm sure all of you have heard of the Pacific Garbage Patch. Again, that is this big North Pacific gyre that's just ended up retaining and keeping the plastic it within that area. So within all of the major oceans, we have these same garbage patches to various degrees. So if plastic's there, what's the impacts of it? Macroplastic, that we know. We've all seen the pictures, we've heard the stories of the birds with their stomachs full, the animals caught up in the lines and entangled. <clears throat> um, all known species of sea turtles are, have been found to ingest plastic. Uh, plastic debris causes ingest, is ingested, entangled, and affecting about 80% of marine life. Um, half of all marine mammals have been found with it. At least one fifth of all marine seabirds have been found with plastic. 
well over 700 marine species now have been found with plastic in their stomachs. Larger whales, whether you're a baleen whale that's filtering, you might get the microplastics, as well as if you're a, um, a tooth whale, get it, getting some of the larger, bigger macro. <laughs> um, so generally speaking, it's been found that 40%, 50% of marine mammals are affected by eating plastic. Um, over 50% of whales and dolphin species have been recorded eating plastic. They mistaken for food. Um, a lot of times these animals are also sicker, we've found. And so whether it's a case of bacteria being brought by the plastic, we don't know, or whether it's just stress to the animals. So this macroplastic is affecting your large animals primarily. It's not affecting your little plankton or your small animals. They get strangled, they get cut, physically abraded by it. Sometimes their stomach gets stuffed and they feel full and they can't eat anything else. Sometimes there's chemicals. I said there's things added to all these plastics. Those chemicals leak out and cause problems to the animals. But plastic also acts like a sponge. So there's a lot of other chemicals, pollutants, good and bad chemicals in the ocean that absorb onto that plastic. And then when animals eat that plastic, they also get those chemicals. Large macroplastic also causes flood damage. It can help to just along with weeds and trees, dam up areas that cause then the water and streams and estuaries to overflow. You also get invasive species being transported on plastic. They raft onto it, they attach on as the plastic is floated around. It's a means of transporting it. It affects sediment porosity, which means how well does water flow through and how well does oxygen flow through that sediment? If you've got plastic in there, it changes some of that porosity and how oxygen and other nutrients can move. It also affects the aesthetics. So for humans, is this a beach we wanna to go to? Is this an area which can have economic impacts? So that's macros. What about these micros? Those things less than five millimeters, what are they doing? There's lots of sources of them. And there's two terms I wanna take a minute to talk about. One is primary microplastics and one are secondary. Primary are ones that are created in this size range. They're those little nurdles or granules that are made and shipped to a factory to be melted down and molded into a bottle or a fender for a car. <clears throat> um, but then there are your secondary. These are the ones that fragment from your larger objects. Off of Norway, so in the North Atlantic, it was found that the primary source of microplastics in the coastal water was from car tires, then from the paint and maintenance of ships and boats, followed by um, loss from plastic production, so just more littering and waste management issues. And then from laundry, your clothes are also a nice uh, large source. Microplastic, there's a lot of different ways that we categorize it. We might say what it is chemically, we might describe it by its colors, but a big way we categorize them is by their shape and their characteristics. So we have what we call granules, pellets, or beads. These are round, nice looking pieces of plastic. Then we have fragments. 
These are usually rigid, hard, broken pieces from a bottle cap, a toy. Then we have our films, which come from our bags. They're soft, flimsy, lots of different shapes. Then you have your fibers. These again come from clothes, fishing lines, ropes, but they can also come from bags as they get shredded and from other harder plastics as well. So a fiber is something that's really long compared to its width. So who ingests and interacts with these microplastics? <clears throat> In the aquatic system, you've got your zooplankton. Little copepods, shellfish larvae. Plankton are small plants and animals that float with the water. Um, from your jellyfish here to some of your selps and tinafores. Also suspension feeders like shellfish, oysters, scallops, barnacles, corals interact with the microplastic. Filter feeders like your baleen whales, baleen sharks, your selps and appendicularians. Deposit feeders, worms, lobsters, <clears throat> humans, plants, whether you're a little phytoplankton, whether you're a seaweed, a seagrass, whether you're grass on land. All of these things can ingest or interact. Sometimes the fibers just wrap around that flat animal or plant. Once it's either internal in the animal or wrapped around it, it has the potential to be passed through the food web. <clears throat> so what does it matter <laughs> if things are interacting with this microplastics? To take it from us for humans, we eat and drink and breathe microplastics. This is just one initial study um, done in 2019, <clears throat> where we found there was a bunch in bottled water, some in beer, some in air, tap water, seafood, sugar, salt, honey. We now know that microplastics are in human blood, human urine, we're all getting it in different ways. <clears throat> so this ingested microplastic, what can it do? It can have impacts at that subcellular level. So for some, depending on the type of plastic, it might affect gene expression, such as even your sex determination. So for oysters, it can affect the male-female um, ratio if they're exposed to polystyrene. It can make changes in enzyme activity. <clears throat> it can cause inflammation or oxidative stress. Again, just like when we get sick, our immune system responds to that, having the plastic in an animal <clears throat> or plant causes stress and causes inflammation. <clears throat> On an individual level, it can cause them to grow slower. They're not getting the nutrition they need. It can cause changes in their behavior, their survival, which then can affect the population or ecosystem. So you've got physical things that can happen, biological things from what's living on that plastic, and you got chemical things, things that are leaching out of that plastic. <clears throat> so let's take a quick look at what this means. What does it matter if you have a full gut? In this study, we were looking at um, some of the corals in the waters around here. These are cold water corals that we found ingested the plastic, and when they did, they stopped consuming the food that they should be eating. <clears throat> so it changed their food selectivity. So 
Other studies have found similar things. Animals may stop feeding or chew. Sometimes they choose the plastic over the food. Um, it can also change things with their physiology. Again, <clears throat> this was work one of my graduate students did looking at larvae from the Easter oyster. When she exposed them to these polyester microfibers, she found the higher the concentration, the more they died. Um, same thing with base scallop larvae, the lipid levels changed. So ultimately the animals didn't grow as well. They were smaller, which can make them more susceptible to disease. How quickly they can recover from this, we don't completely know. Potentially it may make them smaller as an adult. They also can have developmental issues, extra arms, missing a limb. Ingesting, a lot of the microplastics get ingested and get ingested. They pass in, pass out through the animal, not really causing any major problems or issue. But remember, it's carbon. <clears throat> and carbon cycling affects our climate. It affects all of us and our planet. So one of the main ways that carbon is transported in the ocean from the surface water to deeper water is through animal uh, waste products. When you have plastic in it, all these little dots here. Plastic isn't as dense as the other items they should be eating. So those waste products don't sink. They don't reach the bottom. They're not transporting that carbon down to the deep water. It also causes them to fragment and break up more. So this means there's less food for deep sea animals. Um, Plastic gets concentrated, so those detritus feeders end up getting an even higher dose of plastic. It can also sometimes affect the behavior, swimming rates, or even how they swim. So these are some other studies people have done um, where they found that with this clam larvae, um, the larvae had to keep swimming when they had plastic in it. They were not able to settle to the bottom to develop. <clears throat> the fish um, also was swimming a lot slower than a fish that was not having microplastics in its gut. So again, the potential for trophic transfer can change. Chemicals, again, can leach from them, which can cause problems with development, uh, growth, <clears throat> and also allow it to be passed up the food web. Biofilms, again, these results that I'm showing you here are things that we've done almost all for the behavior ones on local animals from things around here in Nantucket or else around Massachusetts. <clears throat> um, in this case, we fed the corals plastic that had E. coli on them. And what we saw was the corals ingested it just fine and then the E. coli sloughed off and went into the coral. So it was a way of transferring harmful bacteria um, which can then potentially cause the animals to get sick. Everything I've been talking about so far has been kind of little animals or animals that are feeding on small particles in the water. <coughs> but there's also the question of can it be transferred through the food web all the way up to a larger animal. And the implications for this are if it can be, 
it could potentially be test, but it's also allowing chemicals to be passed and potentially bioaccumulation to occur. <coughs> and again, animals, humans are exposed to plastic throughout that whole plastic cycle. Every place where it leaks out, there's the potential exposure to it. <clears throat> now, most of these impact studies have been done in the laboratory um, and at higher concentrations than what occur in the water or sands. However, recently we're starting to look at relevant natural concentrations and seeing if there's impact. And in this one study, uh, this was actually in some seagrass beds. What they found was when there were no microfibers around, the clams were really happy, the nitrogen moved, your diet was living there. When you had a bunch of microfibers settling on that sand, the clams stopped burrowing, stopped moving around. We started getting cyanobacteria living there as well. And the nitrogen did not cycle the same way. On land, they found when you had no microplastics, you had lots of worms, earthworms, the grass grew really well, everything was happy. When you had microplastics present, you had less worms in the soil, your grass didn't grow as high, you had less root mass. So this is again just reviewing this concept of mass being your water bottle, your big things over there, and your number. So your microfibers, your microplastics, there's not as much mass, but there's much higher numbers of them. So ultimately, potential impacts are probably going to be more with these micro or nanoplastics than they are with the big macroplastic. So we know now that plastic is everywhere. It's in the ocean, the ice, lakes, rivers, soil, air. So what about here on Nantucket? So Nantucket is an amazing island with a lot of diversity. Diversity in its land, diversity in its coastal environments. Also, a lot of human impacts to it. So you've got the Atlantic hitting here on the south side, much bigger waves, high energy. Lots of people like to swim and surf over there, enjoy the beaches and walk with their dogs. You've got your harbor which is an amazing big area. It's very sheltered. You have oysters and bay cells, lots of fishing and boats more there. You have bigger yachts coming in as well as all the ferries and commercial boats. So a lot of traffic in and out of there. <clears throat> and you have your gray seal population up there on Great Point. Over here at Manikin, you also have a little bit more of a protected area. Again, a very important base scallop fisheries area. So when we started this work, we decided to look at some different beaches that were having different human impacts, human uses, as well as different environmental uses. So the areas that we studied were Surfside Beach, number one, Madiket Beach by Warren's Landing, number two, uh, the harbor by the public docks, number three, and Coscada Beach, number four. And Coscada, we just started a year ago. <clears throat> Um, the two stars represent where we're also doing some atmospheric sampling. Again, something that just started in the last year. 
As I said early on, this project involved lots and lots of people, lots of students, lots of volunteers, people from the island, people from UMass coming and working together. So to do it quickly, uh, the methods for the water, we wanted to really look at this inner tidal area, the area where the waves come in and out are exposed and is also a very dynamic area and an important area for a lot of marine life. Birds feed there. There's a lot of uh, mesoplankton that dig down into the sediment. And as the tides come back in, you have animals, crabs, fish living in that area. So we would wade out to about three meters and collect water samples using a water grab. We would just take a large mason bottle, one liter, and we would get three different bottles out in the water back in the lab. We extracted the microplastics by filtering them out, ultimately getting them on a glass microscope slide and looking at them under the microscope. For what was in the sand, we conducted transects between that low tide and the high tide line. <clears throat> um, so we ran a hundred meter transect and we took quadrats all along that, either 10 or three, depending upon the years. We sieved that sand through different uh, sieve fractions, looking at microplastics under five millimeters all the way down to about 63 microns. To get the smallest ones, we would do something called density separation. We made really dense saline water. The plastics, most of them are less dense and they float up. So then you can decant them off and be able to count them. Trying to see if it got into the food webs and some of it, um, we did two things. We looked with oysters and bay scallops because they are suspension feeders. So they're feeding on any particle that's floating there in the water. So we would take the bay scallop and the oyster. We looked at the whole animal. So we opened the shell took the whole animal out and anything right around it, rinsed it a tiny bit, but not a lot because we wanted to know what was retained within that shell as well. With the oysters, we also dissected out the digestive tract to see what was present there. We had to digest this. Um, we used an enzyme trypsin and then we filtered it and counted it. Atmospherically, we have these collectors at the field station and by the shellfish hatchery where we're collecting particles um, monthly. And so we get both wet and dry deposition. Again, organic matter falls in there. Sometimes there's bird poop or insects. So we digest that, get rid of them. And then we again separate it and look at the plastics. So looking at some of our results here, we have microplastics, simply. Looking at that intertidal beach sand, and right now, as Yvonne said, there's gonna be posters tomorrow. So I'm just going over the general story. Looking from 20 to 2020 through 2022, only right now, at our four different beaches, microplastics per kilogram of sand were 100 to about 130 pieces. Um, and generally speaking, Nantucket Harbor and Costada had the higher concentrations. But I do want to note that Costada only had four sampling points, where the others all had six. Um, 
our goal when we started this project was to try to get a baseline to understand so that we could determine with time is microplastics becoming more of an issue out here on the island or is it getting better? And so we have all these samples from 2019 through 2022 from Surfside, Mattaquet, and Nantucket Harbor. The red line is showing the long-term average. The blue bar is one standard deviation around that. And what you can see is that most of the points within Surfside stay within it. You have one point in 2020. So it was in the fall when COVID had first started, that was high. Same kind of result with Mattaquet. You had one low point, one high point. Nantucket Harbor, similar ideas. Again, one high, most of it within this. So over time, it seems like there's some natural variation, um, but it's staying relatively consistent. We're going to dig into this a little bit more, see if we can understand it better. In the seawater, this is just looking at some of our early data from 2019 through 2020. Um, again, microplastics are present. Uh, concentrations range from one to 32 microplastics per liter with a mean for all sites of 11. Now, Surfside had a little bit lower concentration you had higher concentrations in the harbor and at Mattaquet. What did we find? We found fibers. Here's a, some microfibers. We found foam. We found hard, rigid pieces. We found uh, that soft, squishy foam. We also found films. And we found what we call uh, fiber knots, where you have so many fibers or strings all tied up together, you can't determine how many are there. So it's in the sand, it's in the water. We were wondering, is it getting into the food web? So looking at the oysters, we collected these from Nantucket Harbor in June of 2019. And in the whole oyster, um, the whole oyster means open the shell, grab the oyster out. This includes also what are called pseudo feces. This is material the animal rejects. It siphons it in then rejects it and says, no, I don't wanna ingest this, but it's packaged up next to it. And so there's a fair amount here it ranges from 19 to 78 with a mean of 39. When you dissect out just the digestive tract, the concentrations drop way down, zero to 14 with a mean of six, meaning that most of this microplastics probably is not getting really into the animal or potentially being incorporated into the um, tissue of the animal. Base scallops, again, here we took the whole animal, a little bit lower concentrations than the oysters had. They had a range of zero to 35 with a mean concentration of 16. But again, it's showing that yes, these animals are siphoning them. They are processing them to some extent. And in some ways that's not surprising. These are indiscriminate feeders. They're gonna feed on whatever's there in the water. The next question was, is it getting into a higher uh, animal, higher up on the trophic level? So we looked at the scat from the gray seals out on Great Point. And we looked at 19 different scat collected in June of 2019, November of 2019, and January of 2020. And what we found was there were microfibers in every single scat. 
there was microplastics. So those fragments or films in almost all of the uh, scat as well. So again, suggesting that it's moving through the food web. So a seal like us breathes air. So we're curious, how much is coming down on Nantucket through the atmosphere? Um, we started this sampling last October and we're gonna run it for a whole year so that we'll get an annual deposition for the island. And the blue bars here are from the hatchery uh, by the shellfish hatchery. The orange bars represent our collector out at the field station. And what you see is there's, the hatchery is fairly consistent. The field station is very variable, but there are microplastics present all the time. Um, but these concentrations are not that different than, than found in other coastal areas. Most of this work has been conducted by my students in my lab. And this past spring, students in a course I was uh, teaching wanted to survey people here on Nantucket and try to see what do people here on Nantucket think about plastic and plastic pollution. So they created a survey that was offered online. Um, and so here's a few of their results. So one of their questions, they asked people and they had 43 different respondents from people that live here on the island which was the vast majority. There were also a few tourists that responded to it, as well as people coming over to work. If you rank sea level rise, erosion, ocean acidification, increases in storm and plastic pollution, what do you think is the biggest um, environmental issue for the island? Sea level rise was considered the biggest but plastic pollution was number two, fairly equal to erosion, but meaning that it was an important issue to people. And when asked just about plastic pollution, are they concerned about it on the island? 70% of the 43 respondents said they're very concerned about it. So what have we found out? What do we know? that plastic pollution and microplastics are around Nantucket Island, not surprising. It's in your water, the seawater around the island. It's in the sand, it's in the air. It's moving through the marine food web. But you know about it and you're concerned about it. Perceived sources for the plastic pollution are thought to be businesses, tourists, construction, and human behavior that, with littering. So what does this all mean and what don't we know yet? Impacts, it's present. And what does it mean? Is it hurting our island? When asked in the survey if people thought it might be harming human health, people really weren't sure. It was fairly equal from unsure to, yes, I think it is, maybe to strongly thinking it is. Compared to environmental health, where majority of the people that thought, yes, it's having an impact in the environment. And I would say this reflects a lot of our knowledge on plastics and microplastics in the science community as a whole. We have done a lot more research on the environment than we have done on humans. Questions, where is it coming from? How is it connected? What's the sources? What's the impacts? And so understanding plastic is created by humans. It's 
ends up in the environment a lot of times because of our behaviors, our way of processing the waste. So how do human behaviors, littering, waste management, how does that connect to fisheries, to sedimentation, food systems? What are all these links, the sources and the connections? Those are the questions that are still out there and some of the questions that we're hoping to start continue this research to really get an answer. So now we know it's there, we know the levels. Now we wanna know what does it mean? In terms of understanding, is it humans? Is it environment? If we look at Nantucket Harbor, a pretty calm area, the more that's present in the water, the more that's present in the sand. There's a pretty direct relationship between those two. Not so at Surfside. It seems like there it's more of an environmental thing as well as human interactions. So as there was more in the water, there was actually less in the sand. And I think it's because of this energetic wave action that's stirring it up, maybe injecting it deeper into the sand that we don't know. Madiket is a mix between the two. So overall, for Nantucket, yeah, microplastics are here. They're coming at you through the ocean currents. It's coming at you from the land. It's coming at you from the air. The concentrations aren't outrageous, but they're present. And so it's understanding what does it mean and how can we make it better? So I'd just like to end with some acknowledgements and thanks to Remain Nantucket, Nantucket Land Council, and the Nantucket Department of Public Works for helping to fund and support this. Um, the SEAL research with the permit. And then there are more people than I can possibly acknowledge, but there are certain people that have to be mentioned. Um, Dr. Stephanie Wood, who has helped a lot with the SEAL SCAT. Uh, graduate students, Shannon Hogan, Shannon Brown, Nick Warner. Undergrad students, Taylor Sayabora, Adriana Voki, Brooke Stedman, and Ryan Giffey, who are tremendous assets in doing this work. So with that, any questions? Yeah. What's been done on a global level for what? What's been done on a global level to attack the That's a great question. So the question was, what's being done on a global level to deal with the plastic issue and microplastic problem? Um, there are several things being done and it, there is no comprehensive global answer yet, but there are, within Europe, there has been some laws and policies. The United States actually passed a policy um, just a couple of years ago to, um, well, there's the Microbeads Free Water Act of 2017 to try to stop the, well, and to stop the production of microbeads, which is, yes, just one tiny part of plastic. So there's a lot of different approaches being taken um, by different countries or by communities, I guess I would say. So the EU as a whole has worked and tried to make some policies for how to deal with it and to reduce. 
there's a lot of stress being put to decrease single use plastic. Um, that is probably the biggest answer. Plastic is going to be around for a while. So the question comes, how can we slow down the input of it? And there are <coughs> industries, people trying to study and see if there's ways we can clean it out of the system. Um, bacteria are actually evolving and are starting to be able to degrade it. So nature may solve our problem. Uh, so no set answer to that question, but places are trying. Yeah? Yes. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned that um, the levels of plastic we have here in America. I was wondering about the other piece of like plastic, the water, the sand, so the concentrations in the sand are very similar to what has been found on Cape Cod. Um, they're similar to a lot of beaches up and down the east coast of America. Um, Concentrations in the water, Surfside is right around what is normally reported using this method. So there are different methods for collecting microplastics in the water. Using the water grab, you get more fibers than if you do a net tow. Um, and so Surfside has a concentration that's reported as an average concentration for the Gulf of Mexico or Gulf of Maine, sorry, excuse me. Um, the concentrations in the harbor and in Madiket are higher, but they're similar to what's been found in other harbors. Um, and atmospheric, so there's, there's really not a lot of studies on that. So there was one study done in Sweden in a coastal area. Am I right, Sweden? Yes. Um, that had very similar concentrations and ranges. Um, there, again, I, since that's an ongoing study, I'd like to hold on to answering and comparing that to anywhere else till we have the study complete. Um, so I'm wondering, is, what, what would be the, the methods for determining whether the tiny microplastic I don't think we're to that place yet. The place we're to right yeah, now. We're starting to our bodies are starting Yeah. No, we're not there yet, but we're there we're to the point where we're seeing what's leaching out of them and our is that being incorporated or used? Um, but that's at specific chemicals and not the building block. What I, what I feel like we're seeing right now is it's being like plastic like a splinter mm -hmm. or like a jet that's passed and maybe your plastic a little bit is still in your gut or maybe bloodstream. Uh, 
Yeah, no, we're not there. Um, is it happening? I don't know. Are animals making their houses? Bird nests have lots of plastic in them. Um, your reef structures have a lot of plastic incorporated into them now. Um, but that's not in the organism itself. I recently heard of a study of beetles, a certain kind of beetle that had an enzyme that could digest styrofoam. And the, the beetles were surviving solely on styrofoam. And, and I don't know more of what it was breaking down in the different scat had polymers in it or what. I mean, your plastic is an organic carbon molecule just like a lot of food that we eat. So there's nothing necessarily inherently wrong if you can digest it and break it down to being able to use that, um, if you can break it down to that level. Um, so there are, yes, a couple beetles and bacteria that I know can digest it down to that level. So that's an, the question was for people that aren't here is, so Nantucket has banned a lot of uh, single use plastic items. And so we're not seeing a decrease yet in microplastics, will we with time? We may um, very, especially in areas that are calmer where things are um, more deposition. But you have to go back to that transport. Nantucket's an island. It's influenced by the ocean currents that are bringing microplastics from other places as well as what you produce here. Now, this study is only looking at that coastal area. So as you ban plastics, you may have less of it internally on the island and some of the land or even in some of the ponds in some of that area where you have less from local sources potentially getting into it. Um, atmosphere again is bringing your plastic from potentially multiple sources and still going to be impacting Nantucket. But every place that can reduce it is gonna help globally. Huh? Did you see any differences during COVID? So there were some interesting differences with COVID. Um, so it is, it appeared, especially with the seawater data, um, and this will be shown more in the poster tomorrow, I think, um, <laughs> that in the harbor, at least initially and in Madiket, there was a reduction in the amount of microplastics present. Um, and so that also corresponded over into the sediment in Nantucket Harbor, because it's a deposition area. There wasn't so much of a change in Surfside. Um, there was a difference, and we have not yet managed to do all the chemical analysis of all these types of plastic, but there was a difference in the, um, and I don't have that data here, the amount of fragments versus fibers and that there tended to be a few more fragments present 
and less fiber. So again, I think it's sometimes the sources of the macro plastic changed. Yes. So um, the seawater and the sand data and the seal scat. Um, graduate student just defended her thesis on it, and so we're working on getting it published. Um, so that'll be getting out to the larger scientific community there. Um, the atmospheric study is still ongoing. Um, so through conferences, we're presenting the result. We'll be publishing it and getting it out that way. Yeah. And then we also submit a report to um, the de um, Department of Public Works here on the island for people on the island to know. Thank you so much. And again, if you have more questions, come and ask me or come, if you're free tomorrow, come and see the posters. Um, there'll be a lot more data and a lot more um, information. It's from 11 to 1. <laughs> At the Nantucket Community School Music Center. Thank you.